Welcome to Club Book with Kylie Reed. I'm thrilled to be your moderator tonight. My name is Nigar Alam, and I'm the author of Under the Tamarind Tree, a novel that came out about eight months ago. Before I introduce tonight's guest properly, allow me a moment to tell you a bit more about the unique series that is bringing her to us. Club Book is a program of MELSA, the Metropolitan Library Service Agency, made possible through Minnesota's Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and coordinated by Library Strategies, part of the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library. Ramsey County Library is the co-organizer of this evening's talk. Thanks also to the partnering bookseller, Red Balloon Bookshop. A purchase link to come and get it will be available in the comment section of this live stream feed. Have it shipped, pick it up at their lovely store in St. Paul, or have them deliver it personally to your door if you're close to the area. One final housekeeping note, also in the comments, you'll see a survey link. Melsa would greatly appreciate hearing what you think of this club book program. It's quick and it's easy. Our guest tonight, Kylie Reed, burst onto the literary scene in 2020 with such a fun age, a fast paced social satire about privilege in America. The New York Times bestselling debut hinges on the layered relationship between newly minted college graduate Amira Tucker and Alix Chamberlain, a wealthy businesswoman who hires Amira as a babysitter. Such a Fun Age was long listed for the Booker Prize, selected as a Reese's Book Club pick, and charted high on best book of the year lists from sources as varied as the Washington Post and Good Housekeeping. Reed's masterful nuanced take on racial biases and class divides is on display once again in Come and Get It. Her sophomore work follows enterprising writing professor Agatha Paul and dormitory assistant Millie Cousins. In service to an unusual clandestine writing project, Millie allows Agatha to eavesdrop on her wards through a hole in the dormitory walls. Notes Publishers Weekly. In this blistering send up of academia, every page sparkles with sharp analysis of Reed's characters. This hit shelves on January 30th. Now, after a short talk by our guest and some initial questions from me, we'll have time for audience Q&A. Simply drop your questions in the comments thread here on Facebook and our tech manager will route them to me. You can also send a message to Club Book through Facebook Messenger or email where we're at clubbookmn at gmail.com. I unfortunately can't start my video as I'm trying. Give me two seconds. There we go. Thank you for that Hello. lovely introduction. <laughs> Hello, Kylie. I am personally so excited to be chatting with you today. I'm a huge fan. And would you like to get this evening started by telling us a little bit about Come and Get It? I would. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. It's really nice to meet you in person. And yeah, I'm going to start with a little reading. I'd like to drop people in. I don't like to say too much. And then I'll say a few words on creating this book. So I'm going to start on page 232. Millie always answered the dorm phone on the first ring. Belgrade, this is Millie. No worries, I'll come down. Sometimes at the end of the night, she poked her head outside her door. Y'all, it's quiet hours. Can you take this to your room? She had a stash of band-aids and a bright blue ice pack in her mini fridge. On her desk was a notebook where she appeared to write down her expenses. Agatha wanted to look at it, but she didn't need to. Millie told her everything that she wanted to know. She was also an excellent observer. She had a democratic way of explaining things, like a volunteer docent at an outdoor museum. A small group is an intimate gathering of people who do Bible study or fellowship. Oh, meal trade is when a restaurant has a special for a night and you can use your razor bucks. She was incredibly diplomatic and she had a way of poking fun while respecting the decisions of others. She was also a strangely talented actress. 
she did very good impersonations. It's not so much like that, Millie explained to Agatha one night. At least I don't think it is. Agatha scribbled furiously in her journal. Millie, say more on that. Well, obviously, if you call yourself a believer, you're probably not going to stab someone or rob a bank. But some things that you'd assume are off limits, they're still done, but they're just different. Can you give me an example? Okay, so if you're a campus Christian person and you're plugged into a body of Christ, is that what they'd say? That's what I've heard, yeah. And if you're just like a cool, naturey Christian person who is probably white, can I say that? Agatha smiled. You can say that. So all that doesn't necessarily mean that you don't gossip or listen to rap music or whatever. I feel like it means that you do those things intentionally, like you do it for the Lord. So if I wanted to gossip intentionally, how would I do that? You would put her arm at the back of her chair. You'd be like, well, you, do you just want me to do it? Well, yeah. Okay. She grinned. This is so funny to me. Then Millie took a breath and put her hair behind her ears. So Agatha, listen, can I talk to you for a second? God's really putting Hannah on my heart this week. Agatha flipped to a new page in her journal. The other day, Millie went on and keep this between you and me, but the other day she did blah, blah, blah. And yeah, it just wasn't the sweet Hannah that we know. And I need to figure out a way to hold her accountable while I do my best to shower her with grace. But I also want to start asking important questions like, is this a godly friendship? Is she going through a rough season? And maybe she is, and that's okay. But if that's the case, is my birthday weekend at Hilton Head the best place for her to do that? Agatha laughed at this last part. You're very good at that. Millie's regular cadence returned. Thank you, she said. I'm kind of impressed with myself too. Millie's experience with a 24-year-old RA was drastically different than the residents next door. Here was a young person who operated without much complaint, whose efforts and time went laughably underpaid. Agatha was fascinated by Millie's gamesmanship, her constant positivity, her starry-eyed hustle, the way she enjoyed a little pop now and then. All of this, her income, her attitude, her ambitions, would be a nice tonal shift from the other profiles. I'm going to stop there. So I will say a few words about the origins of this book. I sold my first book, Such a Fun Age, when I was in graduate school. I was at the Iowa Writers Workshop and I sold it in the two in the, the summer before my first and second year. And so it was June of 2018. And so the wonderful and terrible thing about publishing is that it takes forever. I'm sure my co-host can agree with that. I, it took 18 months before it came out into the world. And so with that time, I was just so like desperate to make something new because I was so nervous about my book coming into the world that I wanted to get deep underneath something else. And so 10 months before Such a Fun Age came out, I started writing Come and Get It. Um, I was teaching at Iowa at the time and I was teaching undergraduate workshops. And these were students who were a lot of business majors, a lot of nursing majors, students who were in STEM, who needed an art credit and kind of liked reading or writing. And that's a world of teaching that I kind of love living in, like to show them things that they've never seen before and, and they're excited about it and it's really great. The way that a lot of my students spoke really did something to me. They were clever and bright and weird and they had this very homogenous way of speaking and it really intrigued me. And I'm not saying that the whole book was born from this, but a little tiny bit. There was something that my students would say, if they started speaking, I would say to them, okay, tell me more about that. And in the very same way, they would say, oh my gosh, I hate telling about this. And it was so tender and specific. And it almost reminded me of that short story, Bullet in the Brain by Tobias Wolf. Like, I don't know if you know that one where he keeps repeating a phrase. I have to send it to you because it's so good. He keeps repeating a phrase that he heard over and over in his head. And it does something to him to ignite his creativity. And oh my gosh, I hate telling about this was, was that for me. So very quickly, I knew I wanted to base the book in Fayetteville, Arkansas. I lived in Fayetteville for exactly one year from August of 2016 to August of 2017. I was, before that, I was living in New York City. I was a receptionist and I really wanted to write and I applied to grad school and I got rejected from all of them. <laughs> it was terrible. I got rejected from nine schools and waitlisted at two. And so my now husband was then a boyfriend, had a job opportunity in Arkansas and said, why don't you come with me and you can try again? And I said, let's do it. 
So we went to Fayetteville. I got a job at a coffee shop and writing articles for a small magazine. And I told myself I was not allowed to buy anything except for wine. And I just wrote my butt off. Um, the Fayetteville is beautiful. It's this really charming collegiate town that's really hilly and fairly walkable and really easy to get around. There's something else that was really attractive to Fayetteville for me. Within the world of fiction, I am obsessed with normalness. I want to see people who I see in real life who are working at Walgreens or going to get their air pumped into their tires. I want to recognize the world that I'm reading about. When it comes to a campus novel, I feel that we often think Ivy Leagues, like cathedrals and big towers and academic striving, when the reality is that most people who go to college go to state schools, like the like University of Arkansas. And so I was really interested in figuring out how money worked on a campus that was incredibly normal, where people's ambitions were a bit more like tempered. And I also just love Fayetteville. And so I wanted to mentally go there again for, for about four years. So this never usually happens, but I'm always inspired by nonfiction. And within this book, I have three main characters. Each of my main characters was really born from reading a work of nonfiction. So I first read a book called Paying for the Party, How College Maintains Inequality. And it's written by two sociologists, Laura Hamilton and Elizabeth Armstrong. This is a five-year interview study that these two sociologists and a team did at a Midwestern university where they practically lived with and interviewed young women at a dorm from their freshman year to beyond. And they tracked their financial status and their backgrounds and the cultures they came from, the opportunities they were afforded, and they divided the women up into what they call pathways. And so there was the career pathway, there was the party pathway, and it's this brilliant study of who college serves and how students are so affected by seeing their roommates study abroad so that they know that they can do that too and how other people feel completely crippled. So not only was it a great introduction to real dialogue from young people and what they think about money, but I was really intrigued by these very academic women interviewing young people. And some of the quotes were just so delicate and tender that I really wanted to stay in that world. So that was where Agatha Paul came from. The second book that really inspired me was a book called Knocking the Hustle Against the ne Neoliberal Turn in Black Politics, written by Lester Spence. I never know how to explain this book because it's one of those, book, those books that does everything. Beautiful prose, some storytelling, extremely academic. It follows hustle culture from slavery to the civil rights era and beyond. There is a chapter, I believe it's chapter three, where the author goes to a faith, finance, and family summit, and a pastor leads the crowd in chanting, I am a millionaire in the making. And there was, some, there was something in that chant that brought me to Millie and her hustle and her ambition. And she's very young, you know, her, her naivete in terms of the fact that sometimes hard work doesn't give you what you want the way that you thought it would. So that's where Millie was born. And the last book is called Monoculture, How One Story is Changing Everything. And it's written by F.S. Michaels. This is a very cool book that I did not buy. My husband bought it and I stole it from him. And it's fine now. It is a very clever and small book about, it is about capitalism, but she doesn't call it capitalism. She calls it the economic story. And it is about how the story we are living in right now filters into every part of our life from religion to culture to family, to education. She has a chapter where she talks about how this boom of markets and all of these choices are actually paralyzing to us. She says that in a class society, we look at each other and we say, those choices that you made, your shirt, your, your pants, your glasses, you're a rational human being. And so you made all of those choices because you know those are the best things for you. That's what we think, whether we know it or not. But life is more like, a big uh, menu at a Chinese food restaurant, the really good kind where there's like 400 things and you ordered three or four things and you're like, oh, this is the best one. But you don't really know what the best thing is because you haven't tried everyone because how could you? So there was something about that crippledness of choice that I wanted to bring to Kennedy Washburn. She's a lonely transfer student and she moves to the storm and she's trying to make friends and 
friends are her currency and she can't figure out how to get them. And she doesn't know, okay, do I go to an improv group or is that a loser thing to do? And what do I wear? And maybe I should just stay at home. And she cannot figure out how to choose the right thing. So those were the books that, that really inspired this work. What was different about Come and Get It than Such a Fun Age was I had the luxury of a research assistant. I also hosted a lot of interviews with college students from Fayetteville, um, Chicago natives, baton twirlers, Starbucks workers, optometrists, um, anyone who I was working with in the book, I tried to work with in real life as well. Um, so many interesting and wonderful and banana things came out of those interviews. I'll leave you with one. Um, there, I interviewed three young women in their apartment. And if you actually want to read more about that interview, I ended up writing about it in the forward to the great Gatsby when it came into the public domain. So it's there. If you want to read the entire thing, I walked in and there was a sign on the wall that said, let's get weird. And that kind of set the scene for everything else. And I did a little bit of what Agatha does. I asked, what does the word classy mean to you? Who gives you money? How, how do they give you money? How do you ask for money? And all of the young women were coming from very different backgrounds. And so it was really fascinating. One of the young women, I was asking her how she gets her money. And I wanted the logistics of it. Is it Venmo? Is it check? Is it put into your bank? And she said, oh, my dad works at a dentist office. He owns a dental office. And me and my brothers don't do anything, but technically we work for him and we get paid from his, like from his payroll. And I was like, okay, so you don't work there. And she was like, no. I was like, but you get like a paycheck with your name on it. She was like, yeah. I was like, girl, I feel like that's, that's fraud. <laughs> that's exactly what that sounds like. And she was like, I don't know. It's totally cool. It's like a practice paycheck for us. And I was like, yeah, but it's real money. Right. And she was like, yeah. So there was something so perfect in the energy from the word practice paycheck that that went straight into the novel. And I want to make it clear that I know I've written satire before. My goal was to not make fun of young women in this book. I think that's a very lazy take. And I also just don't think that these young women are dumb or, or you know, inconsistent in their thinking. I think that they're very young. And I think that sometimes they're really clever on one page and sometimes they make really big mistakes on the other. And I think I still do that even though I'm not a young woman anymore. I'll finish this by saying, Come and Get It is a book about buying things and the nightmare of believing that you'll be better if you can spend your money properly. This is a much different novel than Such of an Age, but it shares my fascination with caretaker roles, awkward moments, healthcare, and normalness. And I really hope you enjoy them both. I'll stop there. Wow, thank you for that. And so many great little secrets you shared with us. I feel like <laughs> We belong to the club now, everyone who's on this <laughs> webinar. Um, you know, you said that you interviewed so many students, and I am wondering, were they as honest and forthcoming as the students in the novel? Or 100%. Yeah. But they were. Okay. Really? I have to tell you, I learned a lot about... And perhaps this was because this is definitely a book that I wrote in the pandemic, but I was interviewing young women before that too. People like talking about themselves. I think that a lot of people, whether they have friends or not, like to feel important and are a little bit lonely. I don't think that that's super rare. And so I think that a lot of people, especially young people are thinking, oh, this person wants to talk to me. This person thinks I'm interesting. And I don't know if that filtered into Millie's fascination with Agatha, but I was very, very surprised at how much young people would tell me. Um, in the same group of girls, they started talking about a young woman that was in their sorority that they didn't like very much. And they were saying, oh, she posts really sexy pictures on, on Instagram and it's so terrible. And one of the young women said, yeah, if I did that, my brothers would lynch me. And she said that in front of me and had no response to it. And I couldn't believe that that just flew out of her mouth. And I need to be a professional in that moment and just let it lie. But then other comments came out of like, oh yeah, she's mixed or whatever. And I don't know why they put quotes around it. I don't understand what that means. Um, but I was, I was shocked. I was shocked that, you know, for many of the young women, 
they got really comfortable and and just really shared with me. And I want to say that I'm extremely grateful for everything they shared with me, even the things that I don't agree with. But I think I was incredibly surprised at how willing people were to share. And when you were interviewing them, you certainly weren't eavesdropping like Agatha. (laughs) (laughs) I was wondering that, is that where the idea came to you when you were interviewing people that if, you know, the, the slippery slope that comes from creating art when you are listening to other people's stories, mm-hmm. did that enter your mind in the creation of, of Agatha and her methods? That's a great question. That would have been the clever thing to do. I don't know if I did that though. I think that the book paying for the party just really set me up to... I don't know if you do this. Sometimes I like to to read about real life events and then say, okay, how could this go terribly wrong? Like what would make this scenario really charged and tense? And I think I was fascinated by an academic woman who was doing this without a lot of journalistic integrity. And for a little bit of odd reasons, it was that book that really cemented things for me. And I think it was some of the the tenderness in the, in the young woman, like there's a, there's a quote that really stuck with me from that book of a young girl saying, um, everyone on my floor has a puffy coat. I don't have one. I want a puffy coat. It's just right. It really, really tugs at your heart. And so I think that the emotion and a lot of the quotes from the young women may push me towards like, what if someone was just overhearing these things and then using them as well. And that seemed a little bit, a lot more complicated and tension filled in a way that I liked. Yes, definitely. Um, we all, whoever has read this would absolutely love Agatha, Millie and Kennedy. And I actually think that you have more main characters in my mind. I felt mm-hmm. deeply uh, for all of them and I felt like I knew them as real people and certainly not as satire at all. I never, it never crossed my mind to be honest. And how do you introduce so many characters and yet make them distinct? I never felt like, oh, I have to go back and check who this is. I just knew. So what is your magic trick, Kylie, in doing that? Oh, I wish I had a magic trick. You were saying, how do you make them distinct? And it's just like very carefully. (laughs) I don't know if you probably do. On a craft level, I do think that there are some tricks that you can do that seem very basic that go a long way. In my first chapter, we're meeting a lot of different characters. I love to throw in people who would never normally be together in a first chapter. And Agatha is meeting the three young women for the first time, and so are we. And so she is getting ready to interview them, and they're introducing themselves to her, and she starts cataloging them in her mind. And she goes, Jenna, tall, tan, Casey, blonde, southern. And then she says, Tyler, hat, mean. So just in her little compartmentalization of them, I'm helping the reader say, Jenna, tall, tan. Okay, cool. But when she gets to Tyler, she adds mean, which is about her personality. And I think that your first chapter is always teaching your readers how to read your book. And that's Agatha telling us, like, there's something about Tyler's personality that's going to matter within this book, whether she's mean or not. And so I think there are tricks like that, that you can do as a writer that, that helps set your, your reader up. But other than that, it's spending so much time with these characters so that you know them in and out. Not that I recommend anyone do this. I don't know if you've done this before. I wrote 80 pages of a RA orientation scene that did not make it into the book. Oh, wow. Apparently I needed to get to know the characters for 80 pages. 80 pages. That's a lot. That's a lot. But I guess you knew them inside out then. I sure did. After that. So anything you wrote, you wrote knowing them so well. It just came out like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's devastating to get rid of those pages. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Did you ever write anything that long? It helped you for sure. It was worth it. It just didn't show up in the final book, but it was definitely made the book what it is. Right. I I have to ask if you have that many pages that you've ditched before. I I'm kind of the opposite. I, really? I, I write really lean and then I have to add. So I'm one of those. So opposite. Okay. We should write a book together. Yeah. We'll <laughs> <be there>. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned themes in, in your talk and the theme of money is, is in this book. It was also in such a fun age. 
Is that where you begin from when you construct your story or do you focus on character or is it setting? Because in Come and Get It, that dorm setting is very immersive. For me, I felt it was very real. I was right there. I wanted to do laundry and wash the sheets <laughs> because it was time. You know, I really felt I was there. So where do you start? That's a great question. I start with characters always. I feel that characters are the backbone of any story and novels take so long. You have to be interested in your characters. It's like working at a place, like no matter how the work is, if your coworkers are okay, you can kind of stay there a little bit longer. Um, it's always character. And in this book in particular, I was really focusing on how we analyze personalities based off of consumption habits. And so a lot of what started this book was characters and the things that they spend their money on. If you can believe it, there are scenes where I'm describing dorm rooms and they were maybe 50 pages longer <laughs> in earlier drafts. It was just like every tiny granular detail of what these people's lives look like. But it helped me so much to understand that Peyton has a giant tub of Lubriderm and her parents write out you know, her notes for her and she has Tums on her desk. All of those things are really shaping the character. So for this novel in particular, it was definitely the characters and this very specific time in their lives where they are looking for dorm room essentials and like what they're going to fill up their first out of house room with for the first time in their life, which makes me want to ask you, did you ever live in a dorm? Well, I did, but it wasn't for college. It was before college. So yes, yeah. But I do have a sophomore in college right now. Do you? Do they like it? She loves it. And when I got your book, uh, just a little digression, uh, she grabbed it because she's a huge oh. reader. She loved Such a Fun Age too. And she devoured Come and Get It oh, in good. three and a half days. And so I think... What could be better than that? You know, yeah, she, she that's perfect. Those, those yeah, <laughs> she's living it. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Um, we are getting so many questions from the audience. I think we should, we should yeah. go straight there. Let's do it. Yes. Uh, one, the first one is, do you believe that Millie was so wrapped up in trying to fit in that she really didn't know who she was at all? Oh, Millie. Okay. So Millie, I really, like early on, I really wanted Millie to experience the phenomenon of when you join a new job and you meet new friends and those friends are kind of mean and you feel yourself being a little bit mean effortlessly. I think most working adults can agree that you end up taking on the characteristics of the people around you for better or for worse when you're in a new environment. For me, Millie was so dedicated to justifying her position in the world as an older college graduate and redeeming herself for these two years of school that she was gone, that she was just really blinded by anything other than get money, have a house. If you have a house and a job, this will mean that you have corrected those two years. Millie's also someone who has always been a responsible person and her hard work has always paid off more than it hasn't. And when she sees someone like Agatha, Agatha screams sophistication. She's like, look at her bag. Look at the way she speaks. Like, I don't, of course this person's doing something correctly. Like she would know if it's not unethical. I don't need to worry about those things. Um, when I first moved to New York City, when I was 20 years old, my mother told me, if you are ever lost, look for a black woman who's dressed really nicely. And I think that Millie has a little bit of that within her too, of just putting trust in someone who looks the part of responsible adult. And unfortunately for her, Agatha's in this time of her life where she's kind of throwing, you know, herself at the wind saying, you know, this year doesn't count for me. So I think that Millie knows who she is as much as a 24 year old can at that point. But I also think that she's in the process of changing. Um, I won't give any spoilers if you haven't read anything, but you know, at the end of the book, she's kind of wondering, was that me? 
that that person who I was for the last three months, or am I a new me now? And I don't know about Unigar, but I've had moments like that as well. I think she's really changing. Um, I was definitely watching those TED Talks in my 20s about how in your 20s, that's the time when you can change the most. And if there's something you don't like about yourself, you need to fix it now <laughs> before you get older. So I think that Millie is she knows herself to a point, but she also knows that she might not be who she thought she was before. Um, so yeah, I think that's where I think Millie is. Yeah. yeah. I think it might even be the first time that that has hit her. And, you know, when she go gets into her thirties and beyond, she'll realize that it really continues, you know, yeah. forever. Yeah. We're always oh, yeah. trying to figure out every new major event is going to affect us in some way. And then we'd have to decide like, who are we now? Exactly. So, exactly. Yes. I agree. Yes. Uh, there are people who are curious about Peyton's backstory. They feel um, that um, they don't know enough. Oh, Peyton. Peyton was such a special character for me, but I wanted to show a lot of restraint with Peyton. I wanted my reader to almost be a roommate with these women. And in real life, you know, you may not get to know your roommate that well, especially if she's kind of hostile towards you and you kind of have to make up your own mind about who they are, especially if they're not very friendly. When Peyton was formed, it was, I knew I wanted Kennedy in that room. And I thought who would be the worst roommates ever <laughs> for Kennedy? Because <laughs> Kennedy comes in very lonely and lost and confused and friendless. And so I, that's where Tyler came in, someone who's incredibly socially muscular and has big opinions and lots of friends and carries herself with a lot of confidence. And the other person was someone who was incredibly unfriendly and that's Peyton, someone who wants nothing to do with her, but is also not really asking for advice. Peyton likes wearing her sweatshirts. She likes cooking her food. She doesn't really need anybody else. And I thought that those would be the worst kind of roommates for, for Kennedy. Another thing that brought me to Peyton was I've known a lot of Peytons. Someone who is just really set in her ways, doesn't need to have a ton of friends, doesn't make a lot of eye contact, and you're always kind of wondering if they're mad at you. I think it's like a very familiar person. And I'm very happy to say that the person who wrote the epigraph for this book, book Lucy Biederman, who's a wonderful person and poet, she read the book and enjoyed the book, which is always really great. And she said to me, I've known a Peyton before. And I was like, amazing. She said, I knew a Peyton I worked with her and her parents and her were very close and they would drive four hours to come and surprise her for lunch. And then they would get on the road and go right on back four hours. And I was like, that's Peyton. That is what I want from a read. Whenever I pick up a book, I want to remember someone who I haven't thought about in years. Peyton is someone who is extremely close to her parents, who's incredibly antisocial, and I love her. <laughs> I think she's a wonderfully delightful, unkind person, and you have to love everyone you are writing about or you will not make it. Yeah, I, I don't even think she was that unkind, you know? I You're think she was direct. Just, You're right. Yeah, yes, she was just being really straightforward and, you know, sharing whatever came to her mind and not out of any cruelty. I feel like she was, she had a lot of self-confidence. I, I don't know if yeah. where that came from, just her, her personality, but that's the sense I got from her. Considering there was very little backstory uh, there compared to others, I have been thinking of Peyton afterwards too. So I think there is something to be said about that very powerful personality she has. That makes me really happy. I was really pleased to bring in Peyton's parents toward the end of a book to kind of shape her world a little bit more. And I had a really nice time uh, picturing Peyton through Millie's eyes from the mail she gets from her parents to how her hair looks. And I was just also really excited to put two very different black women in the same room. One of whom is like, oh, we're, we're together in this. And the other one is like, no, no, you're not. <laughs> Um, another question from the audience. My book club loves your dialogue. I personally love your dialogue too. I think it is stellar. It's, um, is it your favorite part? Just quickly, can I ask you that? 
because it feels like it. It feels oh, like yeah. Oh, yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let me continue with the question. Hearing you read it out loud really brought to mind why we came to that consensus that her book club loves your dialogue or their book club loves your dialogue. Without meaning to flatter shamelessly, I will ask, is that something that comes easy to you? Is it something you looked to perfect through those interviews or by other means? That's very, very nice. Um, I think it's, yeah, I think you're right. It's so clear that dialogue is the place where, <laughs> where I where I really love to put all of the truth and energy into because for me personally, dialogue, it can just set my day on a different note. If I hear someone say something a certain way, it'll make me want to start crying. Um, and I don't even have to know that person. And I feel like dialogue is so powerful. And when I recognize, oh, that is how she would say that thing, that just does something to me. And I really want to nail it in every in every aspect. I studied theater in college and I read a lot of plays and became really obsessed with the rhythm of communication and word choice and, and how one little gesture inflection can really change an entire sentence. And so I've been obsessed with dialogue for a very long time. Um, I definitely did interviews to make sure that I was perfecting my dialogue. I wanted to really have that world just be imprinted on my mind and be able to mimic the speech and also um, do it in a way that it's it's difficult. I wanted to do it in a way that was incredibly realistic to a point where it's like almost haunting, but I also had to dial back a bit. We as humans, we speak terribly. <laughs> I don't so, know. So poorly, so poorly. So poorly. I don't know if you've ever transcribed anything when my husband was doing a, a big investigative piece, I would transcribe a lot of the interviews that he did and every other word was like, oh my gosh, um, I don't know. Like we just have so many little like starts and stops and it takes us a really long time to get into anything. So I really wanted my dialogue to be incredibly realistic, but I didn't want to make fun of anyone, but I wanted to be accurate. So there are a lot of like, oh my gosh, in the book, in real life, there were maybe thousands more, but I'm trying to pull back so it doesn't feel grading on the page. And so it's a lot of push and pull, but as a writer, I don't know if you do this too. If someone says something that I think is fascinating, I'll just write it down. I'll just write it down on my phone immediately, whether I use it or not. I'm like, that did something to you, save it and figure it out later. Um, dialogue is definitely my favorite thing and, you know, hopefully I nailed it in this one. Yeah. Thanks. You absolutely did. There's a similar question, um, which I will just take out of order because it, it's about dialogue. Yeah, sure. Um, it says, I appreciate Miss Reed's deft use of vernacular, something my book club noticed in both books. I'm wondering if the author or publisher ran the novel uh, by sensitivity readers from that generation to make sure it was believable. The author did, yes, because I want to make sure. <laughs> yes. So I definitely put this book in front of young people to make sure that I was doing the right thing. And something, there were ma many little things that I changed. Like in the beginning, I have young women saying, oh, I would get married way late, like 27. And I had a young person who had just graduated from college read it. And she said, no, people would think that at this school or in this town, but at Fayetteville, they would think that maybe 30 was a little bit late, but 27 is totally fine. So I changed it. I trusted her and I want to make sure that it's accurate. So I had a lot of young people from my agent's assistant to other people that offered to read it for, for pay. I also had those three young women from the Let's Get Weird apartment serve as like stoolies to me. They were always available on Instagram. If I was saying, what kind of hair curler would you use? What kind of this would you use? Would someone say this? And they would just write me back immediately so fast because they're always in their phones. <laughs> <laughs> help me uh, make sure that I was getting everything correctly. One thing that was so fascinating was when I had young people read the book, they all had a really strong response to Kennedy. They were like, I know this girl. And they, uh, two of them said to me, I know this girl, I feel bad for her, but stay away from me. Like, I don't want that desperation. Oh. And that felt to me like I had like tapped into the thing that I wanted of this young woman who's cute and likes to have fun, but just can't 
break through this barrier of, of making friends. And so absolutely. I think if you have a book that deals with a certain, you know, type of person, you should definitely put that book in, into their hands. And so from people who have only had queer relationships to people who are from Chicago, I definitely put this book in a lot of different hands. Yeah. Wow, that's a tremendous, a tremendous amount of research, I feel, you know, considering that we tend to think historical fiction requires the research or, you know, sci-fi or something like that, but this is contemporary and this is why it feels so real and because you've just put in so much work. Um, Thank was, you. I just want to, I want to nail it every time. And it's so funny how, like, I feel like technology makes it so that when you're doing a book, that's only five, six, seven years ago, that you have to do the research to make sure that you're nailing that time period really well. Um, it was unfortunate because I wanted to go back to Fayetteville and make sure I was getting everything right. But then the pandemic happened. And so I just said, okay, this is a book that happened in 2017 because that's when I was there, which meant I had to go on Google maps and take pictures just to make sure that everything was perfectly the way that I remembered it. So not my favorite way to write a book, but for this time it worked out. Yeah. Well, I'm sure the amount of research you've done is 10 times more than has actually ended up in the book. Oh yeah. Oh, I read an entire book on animal law because I thought dogs would pay a bigger role. It was so boring. I thought I would find something I didn't, but you have to do the research just to make sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, there's another question about your uh, writing process. So we're going to go from research to, to your sure. writing process. Yes. Could you tell us about your writing process? process? Or do you have a routine um, or a ritual that you start the day off with? In my dream life, I do <laughs> I feel it, you know, writing such a fun age, I had a much clear process every morning in the beginning, I would go to a coffee shop and I would write for about three hours. And then I would maybe read or edit for an hour or two later in the day. And that was what I did five days a week. And then when I had more of a body of work, when I was in grad school, I would work for eight hours a day just to stay in the world. And my husband would like knock on my door and put little bowls of soup outside and snatch them and take them in. So I just wanted to stay in it. With Come and Get It, it was a bit more, you know, it was a bit more, it looked more like life does. The pandemic was happening. I was pregnant during this book. I had my daughter during this book. And so like wonderful and terrible things are always happening. I think that to maintain a life as a writer, you need to be not so picky about your process. I would love in my dreams. I work every day from nine to two. That is like the dream, but you have doctor's appointments and you have to you know, have different appointments or go and make sure that like something is clean. Like there's all of those things too. And so I think it's great to be flexible because you can find something magical in those little hidden parts. So with this book in particular, I would write a lot of it by hand. And so if I was going anywhere, I don't know if you were like this, but during, during the pandemic, it was a scary time, especially in those first five months or so. And so if my husband had to go anywhere, I was like, we are a unit. I'm obviously going to. So I would go with him and I would bring a stack of index cards in the car and I would write the novel on those index cards. And so a lot of it was just in the in-between. There were many nights where I would nurse my daughter and then I would get right back to writing because I had something that I wanted to write about. So in my dreams, I have a, you know, everyday kind of process. A big part of my process is going for a walk. I write for about an hour and a half and then go for a walk, come back, do it again. Um, but things happen. And so I'll take whatever spaces I can get. Yes, absolutely. And you mentioned that you sold such a fun age between your two years of your MFA. Is that right? So you had one year uh, of MFA while you started Come and Get It. Okay. Yes, yes. Did that sort of give you more time than you've ever had since then? Yes. <laughs> I hear that about, you know, writing during your MFA. There are people in the audience who have uh, questions about that too. Oh gosh, um, don't waste it. Yeah. <laughs> it is so much time and it doesn't seem like it, but it is like the best, like concentrated time on your work. 
I'm sure, I'm sure. And the question is, what advice would you have for an aspiring novelist, particularly one who is MFA track? And so don't waste it, for yeah, sure. Right. One. And I teach at an MFA program right now. Um, oh, man. I think that there's a specific attitude to go into workshop with that you could really, your writing could really behoove from, from handling it. You don't go into workshop to learn, is this good? You go there and you sit back and you write everything down and you wait for something to really ignite in you. And there are those wonderful moments when someone's like, oh, why didn't she just like go in the door after? And you're like, oh my God, of course. Like, and it just like sets you up so perfectly. I think paying attention to the things that just like jump into your soul in workshop rather than like, oh, so-and-so said I had like a pacing problem or whatever. I think that's a better way to handle workshop than anything else. Also listening, like going into other workshops. Okay, listen, be generous to your readers, and like focus on their work. But I like applying other people's workshop notes to my own work. And like trying to find notes on my own things and saying, ooh, like I could do that too. Ooh, she does that. Oh, maybe I could add this here. Like trying to get something out of every single workshop for your own work. I think that's a big part. Um, trying to stay reading all the time. It's a really precious time. Just <laughs> keep on reading. Um, and also just be kind to your professors. I think that a lot of MFA students feel that if they're talking about their work, then they're doing something more with their work. Don't get into the trap of thinking, well, I went to office hours, so I'm good for today. Like that's wonderful if that gives you some inspiration, but the work happens in your house alone with your work. That's where the real, real magic is. Um, I would also say if you want to interview someone or get information, the fact that you're a student and you're like, hi, I'm an MFA student here. And I was wondering if I could chat with you. Most people will chat with you. It's very, very cool. So whatever you're writing about, if it's like jealousy or soul cycle or whatever, like people will talk to you about those things. And I would get in the habit of not just writing about what you know, but like knowing more now. Yeah. Right. The knowing more part with all of the nonfiction reading also, right. It's not just fiction. I feel um, these are great tips. You should put them all together and sort of. <laughs> Listen, to, at, at the last my last classes I always give a note on 20 things I wish I'd known when I was younger and so it's growing every day so if you have any for me too let me know no that's that's very helpful very much appreciated by the audience can we talk about this cover oh girl yes. you didn't even show everyone let's show it off this Beautiful, stunning green and the yellow that just pops from it. And the title, Come and Get It. Can you tell us about that? Girl, I fought so hard for this cover. So I'm really... <laughs> <laughs> you fought and you won. I fought and I, I love the cover so much. So originally for probably two years, I thought, maybe three years, I thought the title of this book would be Suey, which is from Wu Pig Suey. It's S-O-O-I-E. And that's like the mascot chant and cheer of the fate of this Arkansas Razorbacks. There was something so simple and spe place specific mm -hmm. and kind of feral about the word Suey. And no one in my novel is from Fayetteville. They're all coming there for very different reasons, but everyone hated Suey. Everyone hated it. <laughs> my editor hated it. My agent did. Our publicist, Katie was like, I don't know what to do with this. And so, you know, I it, it would just cause a lot of like, what, what, what is That's the title? Exactly. So, yeah. Exactly what it Everyone was like, shooey, zooey. I was like, okay, this isn't working. So we went back to the drawing board for a second. We thought about fun money, but I was like, I can't have two books with the word fun in one title. And then my babysitter was like, that sounds like such a fun age part two. And I was like, you're right. You're right. And then one day my agent and I were texting and she said, what does suey mean? It means like here pig, come and get it. And I was like, there's something there. It just felt really electric and it felt like moneyed and had that same feral quality. And when I told my babysitter about that one, she said, ooh, I'd pick that one up. And so that made me feel better too. There was something really electric in it. And I'm glad we went with that one. And in terms of the cover, we knew we wanted a pig very early on. Yeah. Him um, hanging off the side. This was my idea. I have to take credit for that one once now. 
I wanted a really classic font and I was so thrilled with that. Um, I have to be honest, we saw so many covers. That is what I can say to MFA people too. If and when you are in a room and you're ready to get your book cover, if they put one in front of you, you do not have to take the first one that they give you. This is the book cover that will sit with your name on it forever and ever. And you want to like it. That doesn't mean be rude, be a diva. It just means you can ask to see other things as well. That's totally in your right. We went through a lot of different covers, but I'm so thrilled with the way that it turned out. And I think that the color and the brightness is kind of in conversation with such a fun age, even though they're very different. And so I'm happy with how it turned out. Yes. And everyone is at the university to come and get something. Is that right? Is all yeah. characters yeah. have gone there um, to to get something out of it. And exactly. Yeah. This is a grabby kind of novel. And so I yeah. felt like that title really hit it. I personally don't have a title the entire time that I'm working. I like kind of know, but, but I try to worry about that later. So many of my students will turn in work and they have a title on it. And I'm like, girl, you do not know. You do not need to worry about that. <laughs> Figure it out later. Let's get to it's work. It's a working title. They need to call it something, you know. That's true. That's true. Yeah. 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 Um, I have a question about such a fun age since we just talked about the the cover of that do you think your fans will see such a fun age adapted for screen and what is your dream casting for Amira and Alix mm -hmm. and I, I hope I'm pronouncing that right you are that is a great question and if you can believe it we are still working on the such a fun age adaptation listen these things take forever the pandemic slowed us down the Strike slowed us down as well, fully in support of that as well. I, I'm happy to say that we have an incredible team in place. I really can't say any more than that. Oh. I'm going to cross my fingers that I have better things to report soon. These things take so long. We've been working yeah. on this for six years, but we're making something really, really great that I'm excited about. And so I'm just going to keep crossing my fingers. Dreamcast, I honestly don't want to say anything because I'm like, don't jinx it. Don't jinx it. I know. I don't want to jinx it. Yeah. No, but we are thrilled and we will wait patiently for it. And oh, wow. everything, fingers and toes crossed that yeah. it's sooner rather yeah. than later. Yes. Yeah. Um, I have a question about the, what, I know, you, you know, people say, what do you, what message do you want the book to, to deliver to your readers? But what is it that you want them to feel? I always feel a book should leave you feeling something mm -hmm. rather than maybe a moral, you know, to the story, but yes. what message, what feeling do you want to leave them with? Okay. This is not a cop out. I promise. Okay. <laughs> I believe that great fiction should do around 60% of the work of the feeling. Okay. And, and the other 40 is something that that book draws out of you and where you are in life at that moment. And so that's a complicated question of like, what do you want this book to make people feel? It's like, well, are they pregnant? Are they having a breakup? Yeah. Are they in the best moment of their lives? Like whatever they pick up from it and remember, it's going to be so specific to where they are in life. I think that this is a book that is a bit, claustrophobic. I think that this is a novel. Most of my novels deal with bad behavior that won't put you in jail, but still feels bad. <laughs> so I think people are often left with conflicting feelings. And I think people are often left with like a bit of a yearning, um, even for characters that they don't love very much. They're like, oh, I just wanted you to, why couldn't you have done, you know, I, I think that that's a, a fun emotion to leave people with as well. Um, I hope the novel makes people feel nostalgic what, for whatever that means to them. Like sometimes I like thinking about moments in my life where I wasn't the happiest. And I kind of just want to give that person a little bit of a hug and say like, you're going to be okay, even though you're kind of depressed in your dorm room or whatever that is. And so I love when novels can take you back to a place and, and make you realize something about yourself. And so of course, I want people to be like, oh, what happens to these people after? Because that's what I love. Um, but I hope that it makes them turn back and, and realize something about themselves. Oh, that is that is excellent because the way you 
made the percentages. 60% is the book and the rest is the reader, right? How they chose to read your yeah. art. Yeah. And I mean, I feel so much discomfort when I read your books and I think <laughs> my tones curl and I think you mean it to happen. You know, I, I feel like that's the best thing because it makes me think. It makes me really think about things that I would not have thought of before because I'm so uncomfortable. And so, that makes me, I mean, I don't want you to be uncomfortable, but that makes me very happy. <laughs> <laughs> I say it in the best way. Yep. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and let's go to our questions here. Oh, how was the promotion of your second book different from your first? I ask because such a fun age was a debut and because thanks to the pandemic it was probably a weird time to promote a project it was a weird time I got very lucky though because such a fun age came out on New Year's Eve of 2019 so I had four full weeks of tour and we went to 19 different cities oh. and it was just the best like it was everything was happening for the first time and it was really incredible. And I was just bowled over by the fact that anyone had read my writing other than like my workshop um, classmates and things. Um, this was a very different tour um, and really wonderful and in different ways. Um, I'm a mother now. And so being away from my daughter, she's very little at the time. She was only 18 months. That was incredibly difficult and just, you know, understanding that like she's okay it's fine dad has got it but it definitely added some different emotions to everything and I think that that's okay you know I think like I'll look back and think about how little she was and and her looking at my books and going mama and like you know I think it's so sweet that 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 was where my heart was pulled to um I definitely had a lot more confidence the second time this the first time around I felt the need to really answer exactly the question that people were asking me. If someone said, you know, what were you doing? Why did you, why did, why did you want to write, write about feminism? And I would say, oh, I did because of this and this and this. Now I have the confidence to say that actually really wasn't my interest. What I really wanted to do was this. Um, and I really encourage any author to reframe a question in their mind and not feel like they have to go with every single question and to really speak about their experience personally. So it was wonderful. Connecting with readers is the absolute best. Um, I did a reading in Fayetteville and it was just so special to connect oh. with people who know all of these places and everything. And usually on book tour, you get to a place and you have like two hours and you have to go. I got there and I had five hours to kill. And I walked around Fayetteville and I was like, oh, that's where Colette and Millie had their fight. And that's where Agatha saw a tie. It was just so special. And so this was a great tour and I'm, I'm glad we did it. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, going back there, and since you hadn't been back because of yeah, the pandemic, exactly. so it must have been, been extra special. Yeah. Really, I just want to say thank you so much for tonight. I just loved picking your brain personally, and the audience loved asking the questions. Um, we are so honored that you came to Minnesota, the home of Target, by the way, I did want to mention to you. <laughs> I did not know that. Target plays a huge role in this book and always happens. Yes, yes. Happy. Yeah. So, um, and we will just end the evening today. Uh, that is unfortunately all the time we have. Thank you again, Kylie, for penciling us into your busy, busy spring. This has been a virtual presentation of Club Book, a long running literary series of MELSA made possible by the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Special thanks again to Ramsey County Library for the part they played in bringing Kylie to us. Before you log off, look for the Club Book survey link, which is in the comments and will be projected in place of my video momentarily. Last, consider joining Club Book next Thursday, April 25th, for their next program. This one in person at St. Paul's beautiful Highland Park Library and featuring internationally best-selling historical fiction novelist Alice Wynn. You can learn more about that and other upcoming events at clubbook.org. Thank you and have a great night, everyone. Thank you so much. That was really lovely. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.